Hi, everyone. Uh, I was going to say uh, thanks, Pat, for that. After going uh, after Steli, I'm not so sure it's, uh, he did me any favours. <clears throat> so maybe I can bring everyone back into the post-lunch lull. Um, but my, my, my plan today is to talk about common sense business. Um, I, I just dig in, I guess, if I can get the clicker. Uh, I think that, uh, I don't know if this is an Irish phrase or not, um, but I think common sense is one of the least common of senses. Um, and we all know people that have good common sense. You put them in any situation and they generally just make a good decision. And we all know people that don't have great common sense and they just tend to make decisions that you go, why did you do that? Uh, and I think in the SaaS world or in the software world, common sense of late in the last few years has kind of been thrown out the window. I think um, with the availability of capital, but companies can raise so much that removes constraints. And I think constraints are a super healthy thing in a business. And when you remove constraints, common sense seems to go out the window as well. And every day you read another article that says, oh, you know, the company raised $70 million and didn't get to escape velocity and shut down. Or they raised $100 million and never actually got any revenue or shipped a product. And you're like, how could that happen? You know, crazy offices. You just hear these stories over and over again and it just seems like common sense is lacking. So I thought I'd try and talk a little bit about, you know, Pat teed up at the intro, uh, about how we run businesses and we try and do capital efficiency and common sense. So to give a, a bit of a backstory on how, how I guess I got to, to talk to you all today, um, I originally ran a company called Hosting365 in Ireland. Uh, it was one of the, or was the, le the leading uh, cloud and managed hosting provider. Uh, small market, but still nice to be a leader, even if it's a niche. Um, we, uh, uh, in terms of being scrappy and common sense, back then there was no VC dollars, and certainly banks, including today, still would not give you any money. So we sold servers. We used to go to eBay, uh, and we'd look, you know, in 2007, eight companies were going bust. Uh, we'd buy their brand new HP servers. They were like a week old. We'd buy them for a 65% discount. We'd sell that to our customers, and every three months we'd go to the bank, and banks love assets. Uh, even MRR, they should see as an asset, but they love assets. They'd, they'd buy our servers and lease them back to us. And we take that cash and we go and buy more servers. And that's how we fueled the growth in the business. Um, we ultimately sold that to SunGuard. And at the time, Amazon or AWS was up and coming. And I'm glad we didn't have to compete with them. But I found a cloud vertical. Um, and the, the, the idea there was that you know, hybrid cloud was definitely going to win. It just made perfect sense. You're going to put your base workload on-prem, and you're going to put your, uh, your, your burst workload, your, your test and dev, or your online, whatever, in the cloud. And clearly, I was completely wrong. Um, but we, it's the only company I've ever raised any VC for. And it's the only one that hasn't worked at all. So around the same time, Cloudability launched. And you know, I did all the wrong things. I, was the, I, I built a team of all engineers. I was the only person not coding. I did work on product. but. Uh, Cloudability launched, I know Matt, they're, they're great, but you know, they kept getting press and they kept raising more dollars and winning customers. And we looked at their product and it was crap. And our product was great and we had the deepest features and we kept building more and more and more. Um, but of course we didn't tell anyone about that. We just sat there really annoyed that we had a great product and the world didn't recognize it and TechCrunch didn't want to write about us. So ultimately, you know, Cloudability went on and raised more money and built a great product and they bought Cloud Vertical for pennies and you know, great. Uh, so after that, around that time, a friend of mine had rolled up a few really small developer tools, and he said, hey, and he sold it to Rackspace. He said, hey, there's lots of crappy companies like yours out there that have you know, built a developer tool, they've got a couple of dollars in revenue, like you know, five or $10,000 a month, and they're, just, they're never gonna go anywhere, and the founders have checked out. So I set up Copper Cloud, and we bought nine really small developer tools, right? So um, all doing kind of between 10 and $15,000 a month. Um, and so, you know, same tech stack, same customers. So with the same team and same developers, we could sell and grow and get great efficiencies. And so that went great. We sold it within a year. Um, and that was kind of the genesis of this, of Scalework. So we did a test fund called Xenon Ventures with Jonathan Siegel after that. And we bought companies that were kind of sub a million dollars ARR. Great products, but not businesses yet. Um, that worked great. And so with my partner, Lou Mormon, we set up Scaleworks uh, two years ago. Um, we raised $60 million. We call ourselves venture equity, and I'll talk about category in a bit. So we see ourselves as the midway between VC and private equity. We focus on growth, but we want to be capital efficient. Um, we raised 60 million and bought soon to be eight companies. Uh, and so what we've learned in this process, I guess, is what I want to talk about now. We've probably talked to, I don't know, three, 400, I, I can't count, uh, SaaS founders over the last three or four years. And these are some of the objections you get from or reasons from people that are not performing the way they like to or are underperforming. Uh, I won't read them all, but some of the ones in bold, I think Patrick mentioned earlier, lots of founders say, I do talk to my customers, but they either don't or they send emails, which is different, or they passionately preach or sell to their customers, which is very different than actually talking to your customer. Uh, 
or once we, build a, once we finish building this feature, it's going to be great, or this customer will buy. And you know, I call that feature-itis. It's, it's rarely that the feature really brings in the revenue. And typically, you build the feature, and then there's some other blocker that the customer won't buy for. Um, and then we need to spend aggressively to hit our growth goals. You've just raised loads of VC dollars. Your targets have tripled. You know, what are you going to do? Well, I'm, going to, I'm going to hire every, everyone and be ready to scale. And these are companies that get in the most trouble because if you don't know how to scale and you hire, you just end up burning so much money. And you, know, you need time to figure this out. So we've kind of distilled, I guess, a lot of that stuff from what we've learned into principles. And you know, they change, but this is the, kind of, this is the, the, the current set. Um, my plan is to talk about the first two in a bit more detail, but I'll, I'll run through each one quickly. Um, price strategy, as, as talked about a lot already, uh, it's amazing that price is just not given a seat at the strategy table and is kicked to an afterthought of sales or, or, or marketing or products uh, once the feature is built. Um, that just doesn't, you know, pricing is probably your most important and quickest lever to pull. Uh, category design, uh, we try and get all our companies to, you know, I think we met, Patrick mentioned earlier, there's now you know, double digit competition in every space. Well, if you can carve out a subcategory or a vertical category and be number one in that, you know, life just gets easier. Uh, we focus on install based health, sounds obvious, but uh, a lot of companies don't have a, a, you know, when you take out new business, uh, a healthy install base, that the, the net install base of churn and upgrades and downgrades is positive or even flat. If you get there, you've got a healthy, stable business. If you don't, and you've acquired very aggressively new business, and your install base is net shrinking, which is most businesses, uh, you need, as you grow, you need more and more new business just to stay flat. That's just hard. Uh, one of our more, uh, I guess, controversial ones always is we, we believe in centralized teams. We just keep finding distributed teams, you know, 100% distributed teams that are underperforming, and especially when they get in hot water, uh, it seems like you know, creative problem solving and, and collaborating is just harder. And I think it's hard to put a process around that in a whiteboard and a water cooler. It's just hard to do. Um, we believe in su success-based investing, so s scaling the spend along with how we figure out how the business is growing. Sounds common sense, but <laughs> it doesn't happen very often. Um, we believe in doing customer interviews, so not just, you know, and I use interviews as a, as a kind of a, a, that word on purpose, because I think as a new owner of a business, you get a great luxury where you can dispassionately talk to customers. And I'd encourage people to try and figure this out. Founders, it's hard to dispassionately talk when someone's talking about your baby, and you know the answers. When you just, you know, get a new business, you can genuinely ask, you know, why did you buy? Why did you evaluate this? How does it stack up against com competitors? If I turned it off tomorrow, would you care? And we don't care. We just want to learn. And every time we do that, we find fascinating insights. Um, and then I put the last one. You know, we tend to get businesses that over-focus on product. And so in the first year, at least, we want to flip that to be a focus on you know, making marketing and discipline. So first one I want to talk about is uh, category design. Um, I love getting book recommendations, and we love doing book clubs, so I thought I'd put up four that have really helped us. Uh, the way we do our book clubs is we pick, pick up a problem that the company is working on or just a general challenge, like finding the category when it's you know, a new acquisition for us. Um, and then the book, you know, we go out for dinner. The, the book club part might take 20 minutes, but we try then and say, well, if we took the rules or whatever we learned from the book, if we took them and applied them to this business, whatever it is, uh, what would that look like? Um, and it's always that framing has just always worked out really well for us. So uh, I guess a little bit on category. Uh, product differentiation isn't strategy, uh, but you see that most of the time. You say, well, my product is different this way, and that's why it's going to compete. And you know, anyone can build a product that'll be do the same or fill in that feature. So that ends up, if you go that route, that ends up being my best salesperson against your best salesperson. And I'll win some, and you'll win some. Or you'll go raise loads of VC dollars, and I'll say, well, I better go raise more VC dollars so I can outspend you and outhire you and outmarket you and outbuild your features. Um, if I can't raise VC dollars, I'll probably go and say, well, then I'll win on price. I'll be cheaper than you, and I'll, I'll win that way. Um, or I'll say, well, I've got the most feature-rich product. And I know myself, so that doesn't make any difference. And so even I look at the last two, like, two words, even as I read this out, that all just sounds like really hard work and tiring. Um, and so what we try and do with you know, all of our companies is uh, create a new category, right? It doesn't matter if it's a small category. Uh, and I think Peter Thiel talks about it, this in his zero to one. You know, find a monopoly. Even if it's small, it's a great place to grow from. And if, you're, if you can create a category, you know, you're de facto number one, right? Because you created the category, you're the leader in it. Um, and Jack Trout in Positioning, it's another book I mentioned there, he talks about, you know, positioning is the position you occupy in your customer's mind. And it's, you know, customer thinks about cars, they think about Hertz. And it's very hard for more than one company to be there. And even if there's, you know, two, Everyone below that is getting near zero business. But if you can carve out a new space, it makes life a lot easier. Um, 
It's also easier to sell a category than our product. I think people are kind of naturally averse to being pitched a company or a product or a brand. Um, but when they see a category, whatever that category is called, you know, if it's interesting, they'll want to learn about it. And if it's not, they've self-selected to a no. And one of the tests of, you know, have we actually got our category right or our strategy right is, is it obviously wrong for some people and obviously right for some people? And lastly, you know, it's easier to run the company if you get a good strategy, right? Because if you get, it gets ingrained in your culture and at every level of the organization, people will know what's obvious to do and what's obvious not to do because it, it, it becomes the company. Um, so that's all kind of macro. I thought I'd give you an example uh, of, of, it was actually a Boston-based company or Boston HQ distributed workforce. Um, sorry, I've got a cold, I swallow. Um, so we, this was a 10-year-old business when we bought it. It had been flat for three years, remarkably flat. Um, when we bought it, it was doing project management and code repos and all in one place was the differentiator, uh, which wasn't working, right? Flat for three years, it says, says enough. Um, so, you know, we got it and said, okay, you know, we looked at our customer base and one of the segments was game developers. We said, okay, well, that's who we, we'll, we'll verticalize and we will be project management and code repos for game developers. And, you know, we digested that for a while and, and said, well, you know, they're a demanding audience. Can we really, with the size of the company we are, say that we're the best PM and repo tool for the most demanding audience? Maybe that's not realistic. Um, I will say that you know, this whole strategy process frustrates the hell out of the companies when we do it because you know, productive teams want to get the answer and run at it. And this takes time. This took us you know, at least the guts of a year to figure out one that was really going to work. Um, and being patient and not getting the answer is, you know, is just tough. So I guess be warned. So then we said, okay, well, you know, we talked to people on, on the purely project management side of Assembla, and you know, everyone loves Trello, but it doesn't do enough. And everyone hates Jira, but it does everything and you end up there. So we said, okay, we'll be the Goldilocks tool. We'll take the kind of focus on UI that Trello have, um, but we'll make it feature rich like Jira. And that lasted like two or three days before we realized that what in our company DNA, in our history, in our, you know, in our skill set internally, in our customer base, makes us think that we could build the best PM tool in the world, because that's what that would be. Uh, if that existed, we'd all use it. Um, and so then we said, well, if you go back to the start of Assembler, it was an SVN tool, it was a subversion tool. Um, and uh, you know, that's why customers use this today. That's often why people think about it, or how they think about it. They think about it. SVN might have been dominated by Git, but SVN is still a market. There was no leader in cloud-hosted subversion, so we could be number one, it could be our category. Um, and this for a while was our, you know, really got in, we can be number one in SVN, we can do it. And our DNA is to do it. We do focus on security and auditability and a lot of the things that, that subversion brings. So ultimately then we said, well, is this a bit like, you know, are we going to get into a religious argument, Git versus SVN? And we know we will, and that's, that argument has been lost. So uh, we didn't want to get into that. And we said, well, it's a bit like, you know, the creative Zen was, you know, a five gigabyte MP3 player. But the iPod was a thousand songs in your pocket. So they sold the benefit. So we tweaked it to enterprise cloud version control. So it's, it, it's primarily SVN because, it, you know, the, lots of people, the people that love SVN love it because of its... It's not democratic, and it does security and compliance and auditability and locking all these things that some people want. Um, but some people also use Git or use both of them, so it's multi-repo. Um, so is there a, a, a enterprise cloud repo provider today that like dedicated to that? We, we don't think there was. Um, turns out there's still a lot of subversion users on-prem that are under pressure to move to the cloud that look at this and go, oh, thank God, finally, this is exactly what I want. I want a super hands-on sale. I need to get to the cloud, but I want you guys to shepherd me there, and I want to, I want to be confident I can do it. So since we came up with this, uh, I guess I've been running with it, like dedicated for three or four months, and every month Assembly is now doing a bigger deal uh, and the biggest deal in the company's history every month. And since we've owned it, the company's just about doubled in revenue. So I don't know, we feel good about this one. Um, next one is... Uh, price, uh, so again, I just think it's amazing that, that you know, pricing is it's a strategic weapon. I mean, of all the levers you have, you change the price. I mean, literally within hours, you, you start seeing the difference in the business. Um, and so it being relegated to an after the fact thought or 10 hours a year, just, just seem, it just seems nuts. Um, again, in the kind of spirit of book recommendations, these are three great ones and obviously anything that Price Intelligently guys do. So four points. Uh, Everyone says do value pricing. Uh, it seems like most people don't do value pricing. Uh, product or engineering founders tend to do uh, cost-based pricing, um, and they undervalue their own time, so it's kind of a double bad hit, so they just price too low. Um, then most people seem to do competitive pricing. You know, you look at the landscape of what have I got and what have they got, and I'll charge this. 
um, which is you know a little bit scattergun. Um, and also, you know, the price you choose, you choose is part of your positioning. I mean, one of the companies we looked at uh, said that they were the the product leader and the price leader. And I just think they're opposing forces. You can't say you're the best and the cheapest. I don't, I don't think, even if it was true, I don't think it's believable. And so, you know, value pricing, there's been so much written about it, it's you know, hard to distill, but the best one-liner I ever got on it was, um, if you take the absolute maximum a customer could pay, right? If they paid that, obviously, they wouldn't get any value. So that's not value pricing, but take the absolute maximum they could pay. And then the midway there, right, is, you know, they're getting value because the midway between what the maximum they could pay, and I guarantee that midway is higher than either cost plus or competitive pricing. So, second one, increased prices. Um, I kind of feel like we, we say this all the time and no one ever does, it's just amazing. Every company we've bought or looked at buying, we kind of, in diligence, give away the farm and say, here's what we're gonna do, and it's probably gonna be increased prices. Um, Everyone says, yeah, I get that, but we're different. It won't work for us. You know, our customers will go crazy. Uh, we'll have massive churn. It'll, you know, Twitter will go on fire. Um, we've probably done it 12 or 14 times, and it's always worked. And, uh, you know, it's a 100% gross margin contribution. Unless you're trying to be a price leader, which we never want to do in our businesses. Uh, we want to be a category leader. You, you'd want to find them fair price. Um, uh, I'll give you a story of one of the companies we did buy. Uh, uh, during diligence, we saw that they had a revenue spike about three years ago, and it kept going up from there. But you know, overnight, nearly doubled the revenue. And we said to the CEO, uh, you know, what happened? And he put his head in his hands and said, oh, that was a terrible day. We increased our prices, it went on Hacker News, and we got so many complaints. And we said, but, but dude, you, like, your revenue doubled and kept growing. Clearly, the market and your customer base tolerated it and liked it, I mean, for a small bit of pain. Um, Again, it's just, it seems just amazing that, that this is an easy one to do and no one, knows, no one does it. Um, don't grandfather plans, another simple one, but for some reason people keep saying it's a standard practice and I don't know what industry other than, than us that, that do this. Maybe it's because our margins are so high, I, I don't know, but um, I look at it as if you do value pricing, you know, then the price you charge is the value you're delivering. And if you, don't, if you do grandfather people, New customers have to subsidize. They have to pay more than the value price to subsidize that existing base. And so, um, again, I just don't believe in grandfathering. We don't do it. And we've never had an issue, really. Um, other than our teams don't want to do it. Our customers have always been okay. Uh, and then the last one, evaluate all the levers. I think, you know, your business changes, your product changes, your customer changes, your market changes. It's always evolving. Your price should change, too. You should, it should be at every strategic meeting. Um, Every now and then you should step right back and go, well, are we, you know, what are our levers? Because your levers of pricing may change. You know, is our plan formation right? Should we change how we charge? Should we meet, meter more, do per seat, do more usage? Should we change the bundles? Um, and uh, again, people don't do it, but, but I think if you, if you evaluate those levers, it's the easiest one to pull. So mine was short. Thanks for your time and uh, take any questions. Got one up here, do we get the handheld? Why don't you just say it and I'll repeat it, yeah. <laughs> um, well, thanks for the presentation. I, I basically agree with everything you said. Um, uh, one, well, just one thing, uh, the, where you mentioned also in the mid price points, I mean, uh, which I think is uh, taking like the highest price for the time of case, I think the mid price. And one of the recommendations in one of those books was to take your variable cost, take the highest price. Yeah, yeah, great question. I'm not sure I have a great answer, but I'll give you, I'll tell you what we do. Um, I do think it's funny when you say, you know, we're trying to educate them that you have to be profitable. I mean, we're, tell us, how, how can you run a business not profitable? Uh, certainly in the long term. And so, 
you know, we typically buy companies that don't focus massively on sales and marketing, so the sales force is small. We almost always, the founders don't want to stay anyway, but we, we bring in new leaders. But, you know, and, and even when you bring in new leaders who, during the interview process, you say, okay, we're going to increase prices, right? We don't believe in the current pricing model, we're going to change it. Even then, so even if you do what you suggest, bring in a new team, it doesn't work. It's amazing. I mean, I, there's, there's an answer. If, I, if, if, I'm, if I'm back next year and I figure it out, I'll tell everyone. Um, there's always a battle. There's always blood on the walls. I don't know why. I mean, you know, the first time I did it, I had massive nerves. And I think when you've, you know, when you've only got one company and it's your lifeblood, and if you screw it up, it's, you know, you're basically dead, it's really scary. And so there's definitely a luxury of, and, and I will say that people do, that have done it once are now like, you know, like loyal believers and say, you know, they go around the company and say, do it, do it, you know. Um, so I guess the answer for us will be to take people that have done it and steal them from our existing companies and put them in the new ones. Um, all I can say is it, it, it's always a battle. We, we, I always end up just doing it myself and say, pick 10 customers, right? We don't do it overnight. We say, pick 10 customers, I'll write the email, I'll do it, and if churn is more than two, let's talk about it. And again, that sounds reasonable, it's still a battle. Um, you always hear, yeah, but we need these features, we need these things, and so most of the things we end up doing are to, to make the team happy to increase price, not the customer. The customer will be fine on day one, right? Because they're already underpaying. Um, so, I guess my only advice is, it's a battle, go rip the band-aid off, just shout and scream, if you lose people, so be it. But once it starts, after the first few weeks of, oh, it's not that bad, then people will become like loyal believers. Great. Any other questions? You already have it in the contract, the existing installed base, and if it's, I mean, how do you deal with the, the someone signed a contract, they're in the term, do you do it on renewal, or do you just overnight turn, turn everyone's monthly price up? Well, I mean, look, if it's contracted, it's contracted, so you do it on renewal. But look, in the SaaS world, most, like, most revenue is not contracted, you know, and if it is, even if it's a year, every month, because we, we I don't, I caution people to do a price increase overnight. I think you should do it over a few months, so, you know, as your rolling 12-month contract base comes in, every month there's a new set of renewals to do, so. There's also something called the, the grandfather discount, which we recommend using pretty aggressively as well, where that smooths it out, where you can give them three to six months essentially for free, um, and then basically roll that price increase, because people, it's a little bit more palatable for, to folks. Yeah, I mean, look, we don't love grandfathering, but, but grandfather discounting, discount, discounting, not a, not discount. Of course, you should give a loyalty discount, yeah, yeah, yeah. but I mean, that's not, pro you'd always give some kind of loyalty over time because you've acquired the customer and they now cost less. Yeah. The others that you've acquired, uh, I, I was reminded of, you know, I used to do editing and people having precious pros, right, that they wouldn't allow a word of theirs to be changed, but they had to be changed in order to be successful for print. And there's a parallel to what you're talking about, particularly in terms of the pricing. And, and, and I'm wondering, do you have any advice? And I, you, I appreciate it's just a hard thing. Sometimes you just have to throw out the author. But do you have advice on how we can shorten that cycle? Because the notion that a company needs to hang out, not grow for three years in order to get to the point desperate enough that those kinds of measures can be taken that frankly, if you were there three years earlier, the company would be that much more successful, right? How can we shorten that path, or perhaps help each other shorten that path if it's not so, if it's something that's very hard for us to do when we're the author of the precious prose? Um, well, short answer is just give Patrick all the business because that's what he does, right? Make sure you charge <laughs> the right the right price. Um, longer answer, I mean, the SaaS world, VCs love funding product product engineers or product builders. And product builders undervalue their time and don't value the business levers. And so, you know, if you don't get someone like Patrick, find a co find someone who, you know, they live and breathe revenue. And try and be more constrained, right? When you, when you say, you know, you just stagnate for three years, like, oh my God, how did you raise enough money to stay there for three years? You're already in trouble. Like, you shouldn't have three years runway. You know, the constraint of needing to generate cash flow is a great one. At the risk of jinxing myself, uh, no. Um, I mean, and it would have to be aggressive, right? Because if you, if you effectively double the price, and we often do it as a business model change, because it should be a business model change in general, right? Uh, uh, you would have to lose 50% of your customers, right? So that would be aggressive. And 
you know, I always say to, to our team when we're doing it, look, first of all, if you only do a few, all decisions are reversible. If the customer base revolts, you wouldn't regret it. You would just say, oh, I'm sorry. You know, we fired the moron who did that. You know, we reverse it, we take it back. And you see this happen all the time. So, so, so I, I, if churn ever looked like it would be high, you would reverse out of it before it happened. Um, but we've never actually had that. If you're skittish, we typically see that you shouldn't do, you, basically once you get over like a 35% price increase, customer satisfaction starts to go down. Um, so you can still do over a 35% price increase, but you need to make a lot more work and put a lot more work into it, potentially doing a, you know, hey, you get this, you know, the original price for six months, the grandfather discount like we talked about, and then they go up to the original price. But typically, if it's a less than 35% and you know, you're, you're skittish, you're probably going to be fine. Just, um, just typically. we've done way more than that. I, I know you have. I think you look, yeah, you look yeah. at healthier businesses. Yeah, I yeah. mean, you know, Assembla, uh, uh, we found customers that were paying effectively 10 cents a user. So yeah. they got like a 5,000% price increase, and they were fine. I yeah, mean, yeah. look, the list price would, would have been a 10,000% price increase. Yeah, so we yeah. gave them a massive discount. But yeah. you know, I look at it the opposite way, and like, some customers are ripping us off, they're paying so low. Sure. But well, I think a lot of folks, like, like if you're, depending on, on what you're finding, so like some of the businesses you find, they're never, no one's put any thought into the pricing in a lot of places. I think some folks, if you're skittish, like starting out a little bit small, because then they can get that confidence to basically go big. Um, basically, you're, you're the Irish cowboy of pricing, it sounds like, where you're just like <laughs> going all I don't in. think I want that title, <laughs> that's okay. <laughs> no, 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 but we've seen, yeah, I mean, it's been cool to watch some of the companies. By the way, I still think most of our business is underpriced. I mean, the point is that you yeah. have to aggressively start right pricing and get yeah. in the culture of the company that, you know, we will write price and we will change price. And once that culture gets there, yeah. then you can back away. I mean, so the successful ones, once the, you know, the blood comes off the wall, then the companies take a life of their own. They're like, well, of course we should change pricing. And yeah. eventually you, you start saying, hey, 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 like, that's too high, you know, yeah, like, yeah, just, yeah. Just, just don't be that aggressive, so and that's, a, that's the win. Yeah, good cadence is like every six to nine months, not necessarily increasing, but at least changing something about the price, yeah. and then you get into that cadence where naturally the price increases go up. So. Yep. I don't know if I have a good answer on that. I think you should, you know, you should never just change the price. You should always look at what the levers are. If it turns out that after looking at all the levers, and if you do it frequently, you know, it's not going to take you days to do it. Uh, mm -hmm. If it turns out that you know, the levers need to, are the same and the per plans are priced perfectly or the, are bundled perfectly, then sure, change the price. But I think it, it rarely works exactly like that. I think the example was at Assembla. It sounds like the company had realized it was trying to be too many things to, to too many people and you had the list of things that you looked at, like where are we gonna focus our next, where are we gonna focus the business? And, and it sounds like some of that is messaging first about and what, what, where you're gonna target customers, but what's the, what's the lead time between saying we're gonna make this strategic pivot, we're gonna focus on this one segment and this, or this one product, and having the product development efforts start to actually deliver things that are specifically relevant to that, to that, to that market? Well, and how do you validate that in real time that you've made the right decision? Yeah, well, I mean, hopefully you don't have to do many, many features. So hopefully the business, you know, you're subcategorizing, but you're not building a new business, right? And so, you know, it is a little bit, this is why I said at the start, it can be a bit frustrating this process. It could take three months or it could take nine months or a year, right? Like, you know, it's a creative process. You're trying to work through, then, you know, you think, I've got it. And you might not change the website and put everything in and do kind of a, a, a big launch, but you're gonna start talking to customers and quickly go, yeah, okay, well, we don't got it and people didn't accept that. But if you have to do a huge feature build, it's probably not gonna work. And so I think you buy time, but look, you, if, if you get it right, the upside is so great that it's worth putting the time in. And look, in the interim, you know, outside of category, unless everyone's got perfect pricing, you know, your next six months or a year of growth could be covered just from doing that. So fix your pricing and in the interim work on category and you know, at the end of that time when you know, pricing levers are optimized, if you got your category right, you're in great shape for the future.